Welcome to this video, the last video in the video series on our successful future deals with philosophical aspects and in this video I want finally to come up with an explanation of free will and responsibility, explain how that works and how it relates back so to speak to those things that we have seen in the more technical series or part of the videos of this video series. Now first again the questions that I want to answer, how does free will work? Are our, are our free choices predetermined? If not, why are they not just random? So why do they actually relate to us? Why they are, are they our personal free choices? And how does a conscious choice work? So how does consciousness interfere with this free will? And can we, we be the primary cause by a free choice? So are we really origin of a new, a new causal chain, so to speak, that we induce? Is that possible? Are we the primary cause for certain choices? Now, of course, we need to talk about what do we mean by free will. And with free will, if you look around in the literature, well, some have uh, some more complex definitions, but the simplest way and the most generally accepted is more or less free will means that we could have chosen otherwise. So if I have a selection of choices, options to choose from, I choose one and in principle I could have chosen another one, I've chosen another one. But the question is actually how to prove that. If we want to prove that, we would actually need to go back in time, exactly to the point where we made that choice, and see if, in, if indeed in some instances, in some of the cases where we returned exactly, would have chosen in a different direction. Only then we can be certain of that. But apparently on the one hand side we don't do that, but nevertheless have the impression that we have a free will. And actually if you think about it, going back in time and space, that's impossible. Our Earth is flying through the, to, to the, through the universe and you can't go back to exactly that position in time and space again. It's impossible. So it, it, that is simply impossible. And then the next question is, of course, how can we then have the impression of free will? How can that be? And if you think a little bit about that, you realize that actually you don't have to know that you can have chosen otherwise. It is fully sufficient if the following applies. Either it is really random, our choice, then we can't know in advance how we will decide and then we must have the impression that up to the very microsecond before the actual choice occurs, we in principle could have chosen either way. And that, on the other hand side, a little bit relaxed, we just don't know the decision beforehand. So he, this means it's really random and this only means we just don't know before, until these microseconds before. And now, of course, if that is really random, or if we don't know beforehand, how does a conscious decision actually work, where we believe that our personal personality somehow predetermines how we will choose? And of course, also, how can we be the primary cause of that, yeah, if that is just random? Yeah, how can that interrelate somehow? And for that, I would like to build up some understanding in the following slides. We first of all have to realize our brain is a complex system. Okay. We learned already something about complex systems in the first video in this philosophical section. And we also realize that any decision is of course a bifurcation. We choose one of several options. So it's possibly not a bifurcation, possibly even a multifurcation. That means, on the other hand side, from the generalization we made at the end of the first video, any decision randomly is randomly influenced by all particles in the universe. Because it's a bifurcation, it's infinitely sensitive to all particles in the universe, anything that's going on, and they will influence that in a random way. Okay. That requires, on the other hand, to a certain degree, that the processes that actually go on, that lead to the onset of a decision, so to speak, that they are really molecular. Are they? Well, of course they are, our brain constitutes, is constituted of molecules, but we can even go a step further. If we look at a synapse, so a synapse connected to a neuron, that is, so to speak, the contact between our neuron cells and our brain, and of course we have billions of those, huge numbers of these connections, and they are actually responsible for the feedbacks that we have within our neurons. And of course, somewhere at one of these contacts, our decision will originally start. And we learned already in the first video that, well, in, in such systems with feedback loops, we have a Lyapun of instability, of course. So a first shift at one synapse will then grow to, due to these feedback things and then will lead to, in the end, the entire system moving in one direction, 
moving in the direction of a single uh, option to be chosen to, really to do that free choice. So that's what is to be expected. So we have a complex system, it starts somewhere very small and then grows, so to speak. Of course, influenced by everything, all the synapses coming together, but at a certain point we can really say that's the starting point and then it grows, so to speak. So our brain is a complex neural system, decisions by vocation, we saw, saw that already. And then we can look at the synapse, especially at the so-called synaptic cleft. And there we realize that the volume in here between the synapse and the next neuron is of the order of 0.04 micro, square micrometers. The distance in this direction is 20 nanometers. And it has been shown that the concentration shift of between 10 and 25 micromoles per liter of calcium ions can lead to a signal being transferred or not. So that initial, initiates such a transfer of information of a signal. And if you evaluate that, then you see that actually it's between 7 and 20 calcium ions that make the difference if, the, if there's a firing occurring of the synapse or not. Which means clearly the molecular level is directly involved and that means also that any decision will have a random aspect. Now one has to be clear of course, all the synapses in the brain are, so to speak, constantly undergoing such shifts on the molecular level, are firing or not. And of course, all of these informations are then somehow combined in order to, to lead to certain processes in the brain. Also the decision if uh, um, uh, one option is chosen or another option. But that's pretty much the same as with the molecules in the complex system. They are also influenced by all molecules around. As we have seen in these molecular simulations, they are influenced by all molecules around. And nevertheless, in the end, they will be moving in one direction, influenced by all of that. And this is quite similar. We have a complex system. All these things occur finally on molecular level, are thus influenced by every, everything in the universe, and thus will lead in the end to somehow the entire brain taking a certain decision or another one. Okay, that's one thing. So it's really molecular level and it's, bif it's a bifurcation, so it's random. Random at that point is, even if it, it can be determined in a deterministic worldview, that would actually be fully determined. The equations describing, well, equations are only description, but the nature, if you assume that nature behaves like that, then it could be indeed determined that all the equations describe that. The molecular behavior in, in the end will lead to a certain decision, so to speak. So it may be predetermined, but we nevertheless have to experience it as a random choice because, as we said, we cannot predict. It's impossible, it's really utterly impossible to predict the outcome of such a bifurcation. Now then the question is, of course, if we talk about a conscious decision, what is the role of consciousness in such a decision? How does it influence free will decisions? Hmm, how to discuss? Well, Conscious decision somehow has to do apparently something with the filing system. The filing system will indeed not know the decision before it has been made. So our conscious is somehow doing the active part and is doing the decision. Yeah, so only that can do the decision. The consciousness can't do. We saw that in the previous video. Consciousness is just a filing system that can't decide. So it's actually the unconscious that decides and then files the final outcome into the consciousness. Of course, the consciousness is thus surprised. It receives that at a certain point. And nobody, neither the consciousness nor the unconscious, could foresee that that would then finally be the decision winding up in our con uh, conscious memory. And thus we interpret that we could indeed have decided otherwise. That is, that's what's leading to the impression of a free will. But now the question is, of course, I asked it already before, why is it our decision? Why is it our personality that defines, so to speak, that outcome? And are we the primary cause of, for that decision? Now, in order to explain that a little bit, I want to go through some examples where we go, where we go through decisions, so to speak. I can ask you, please make a choice. You have two options, A or B, which one do you choose? And if you don't have any preference for either of the letters, you will randomly choose. So there, actually, it's not a problem if the choice is really random. Yeah, A or B, or you can ask for other things, geometries or cities or whatever. If you don't have any preference, it doesn't really matter. It will be a random choice. You will choose either one. Or if you want to tease me, you say, well, it's, I choose C, C, for example. Yeah, of course, it's a free choice as well. Sure, also random. Then we have our daily micro decisions. 
Well, these daily micro decisions, if I stand here, I'm using my gesture for that. I don't consciously control that. That just happens. Yeah, That's um, maybe random to a certain degree. In the morning, actually, uh, my uh, alarm clock rings and then the question is, well, do I already get up or do I turn around? If I get up, well, do I step out of the bed with my left or my right leg first? These are the daily micro decisions where actually we have, of course, our procedures through which we go. On the other hand side, it doesn't matter. It's just random. Yeah? If I move my hand like that or like that or up or down or how I exactly do that with my gesture, it doesn't really matter so much. And that, that there are significant contributions from randomness involved in such micro decisions, that's not, that's not a problem. Now it's getting a little bit more tricky. I'm at my favorite Italian restaurant. Let's imagine that. I've already said in some of the other videos, I'm vegan. So I only have two options from the menu. It's on the one hand side, spaghetti, aglio, e olio e peperoncino. I love it. Yeah, so if you want to make hap me happy, that's the dish. And all the other option is that I have a nicely prepared, colorful salad with a sauce vinaigrette. So these are the two options that I have from the menu. And since I like it so much, I will in most cases go for the spaghetti. And say in 85%. And only 15% choose the salad and if it were only for some diversity. Now actually, this probability that I in 85% choose the spaghetti and only 15% choose the salad, that's of course representing my personality to a certain degree. Other people have other choices, of course, other preferences, so to speak. And that's one thing. So my personality is actually not necessarily represented by the individual choice, but by these probabilities. On the other hand side, if I am now at a, at a special point in time at that Italian restaurant and I choose, my choice may indeed be more or less random, depending on arbitrary things that I cannot control, that are not controlled by anything. So the choice actually may be more or less random, as long as this ratio, this probability, the uh, preference corresponds to the probabilities, 85 and 15% overall, it's representing my personality. And of course, it's worse, you will have realized that from the total menu, many of the options that actually exist for me have a probability of zero. I won't choose scallopine, for example. I won't choose that because I'm vegan. And there you realize actually that the probabilities cannot only be somewhere, say, 50% 50, 50 or 85, 15%, they can be zero or one. One meaning I will always choose that. That's, I'm, that's my personality that I choose this. I will, for example, I don't know in the train, always look in the forward direction of the train motion, for example. So that, those are those things where you, we have choices this way or the other way, and we have probabilities, predispositions, so to speak, preferences that represent our personality. These preferences corresponding to the probabilities, the probabilities can be lying between uh, equal for all options, 50-50 if there are just two options, or they can be 0 or 100 percent for choices that we made consciously. And there we see that where actually the consciousness comes in. We remember that de we deliberated about being vegan, for example. Some time ago I thought about that and I got information about that and then decided to be vegan. And that automatically, I remember that, this interaction between, un between unconscious and consciousness, then I remember the outcome, I want to be vegan, which means I don't eat any scallopina anymore. And then the choice will be zero for that option directly. And that means the consciousness, so to speak, presets the probabilities for my choices. My personality, also spaghetti or salad, has certain probabilities represents, representing our person, my personality. But for each individual case, the choice will be random. Of course, if my probability is 0%, probability can't, or the, the, the randomness can't do very much about that. Also, if my choice is 100%, my randomness can't do anything about that. But if it's somewhere in between, then of course randomness comes into play and then one, may, one time I may choose this, the other time I may choose that. And that means for each individual choice, I can, cannot know in advance because that is coming from the unconscious, this is bifurcation taking care of all the interactions with all particles in the universe. So I can't predict it, so I have to have the impression that it is 
uh, really a free will, undecided before and only in the last moment I then decide. And on the other hand side I have the impression it's my free will because I am presetting the probabilities. I am de determining consciously these probabilities. That's why it's my uh, uh, choice. On the other hand side we also see directly that we are the primary cause because the bifurcation starts in our brain and then goes in one direction. We then choose, I choose the spaghetti, I order them, I eat them, so the consequences result, result from that. On the other hand side, well, what was the origin of that choice? What was that? Why did I choose the spaghetti? Well, it was molecular. On molecular, molecular, we realize, molecular level, we realized there is no cause and effect. So there is no previous cause for the choice of going for the spaghetti. So we, the processes that go on, on in our brain, this bifurcation that then occurs, randomly initiated, that actually triggers the entire causal chain that I choose the spaghetti, I order them, I eat them, and so on. Yeah, so the causal chain really takes its start in our brain. And that's actually why we are the primary cause for these decisions and all the outcome of that. So our structure, our personality, our preferences preset the probabilities of the options from which to choose. It can be varying between randomly between uh, to zero or one. So it's random, but it can the probabilities can be zero or one. So then, of course, the randomness has not too much chance to influence that. And the free will is thus an intricate interplay between the randomness and our defining structure, our brain structure, which depicts, so to speak, our personality. And as I said already before and explained, we can be the primary cause because on molecular level, our decision is not predetermined. And actually, we realize from that we re really need both things, the real randomness uh, that occurs in cases where the choices are not 100% in one or the other way, because only then we can have the impression it's not always our personality. If it were always our personality, then we would know our personality and can predict what the outcome would be. But that's not how we experience it. We experience in some, time, in some cases the random decisions. And that means also in such cases possibly we are not quite sure how we will choose. Well, with vegan, I'm pretty sure I, I know my personality, I won't choose scallopini, but in these cases we actually don't know how we will decide. And so it's the real randomness that comes together with the us not knowing in advance how we will decide. Now, of course, we, that induces also our responsibility because we are the primary uh, starting point, the primary cause for our choices. That means our personal structure defines our preferences and the randomness can only become active within these probabilities. Thus, the outcome of our choice is to be attributed to our personal structure. It's our structure that defines finally the probabilities and that determines, so to speak, or guide the randomness in a certain direction which in turn means any positive or negative feedback has to affect our personal structure. Yeah, if I do something socially not acceptable, then the feedback from society has to go to my brain structure such that the next time I come in the similar situation, I would go for the other option. Yeah, so blame, uh, for example, or also giving positive feedback, all that has to lead to a change in my brain structure increasing the probability for the next time or decreasing it. So it has to go back to my brain. And that's what, is, what I can directly understand. That's what is meant by responsibility. I have to take the consequences. My brain structure has to take the consequences for the decisions that are made because only then it can feed back to my individual brain structure. So we are personally responsible because we are free and primary cause and it's our personal, individual personal structure that is that cause. On the other hand side, we see this is just a given. We cannot negotiate that. And that means the responsibility cannot be avoided. It always has to be feeding back to us. So we are, by this interplay between our personal structure and the randomness, it's always us who decides. It's thus us who is responsible because we have the free will and it's our personality that limits that, so to speak, within these boundaries of the probabilities representing our personality. So we are responsible for what we are doing and we can't avoid it. We can't say, oh, I didn't know about that, so I didn't account for that. Yeah, here we are talking about our successful future, about waste of fossil resources, for example. We can't say, well, I 
just didn't know that that is so negative. Well, meanwhile, you should be able to know on the one hand side, on the other hand side, irrespective if you know or not, because you are free to choose and it's your personal choice that you come up with, you are responsible and you can't avoid that. No way around that. You are simply fundamentally responsible. That, of course, then leads directly to ethics. If, uh, since we are the primary cause and we can freely choose our actions, we are automatically responsible. I explained that. And now we can, so to speak, see how does ethics work. And there we have to realize that typically we assume it's, uh, one concept of ethics, so to speak, that ethics is discursive. That is, we negotiate with our co-humans about what we may do and what we may not do. So we talk, so to speak, well, I, uh, well, for example, in, in the, uh, well, it's not really ethics, but a simple example in the, on the streets, if we drive our car, I'm coming from here, you are coming from there, who has the right of way? How do we do that? How do we do? Yeah, and then we realize there is a way we can do that such that both have our rights and our duties and that works out fine. Of course, it applies to all things about ethics. Yeah? What may I do in public? What may I not do in public? What can I do at home? And all these things, they are discussed. And they are represented, our current status of that is represented by the human rights that we have on a very fundamental basis and of course mirrored also in all the laws that we have in all countries. So that is, so to speak, the result of the negotiation, how our society should work and how the outcome of this discursive ethics actually, uh, what, what that results in. There are some things that are fundamental and the basis is that everybody has equal rights and obligations. That's very fundamental and that's also, if we negotiate with our co-humans, that is implied more or less, everybody has the same rights. So we really have to talk to the others in order to see what they actually want and then find an agreement how to optimize our interplay, so to speak. At the same time, we have to realize in ethics that there are other things which are not negotiated. And that is a little bit difficult to understand if you Take, uh, if you think about this discursive way, you can negotiate with everybody about your ethics, but there are some things that cannot be negotiated, and that's other boundary conditions. They cannot be negotiated. If we use more fossil resources, yeah, if I drive too fast or if I drive too big car, for which I'm responsible, that's my personal decision, then I'm emit emitting more CO2, and that I cannot negotiate with the environment, don't cre increase the, the temperature of the, the global mean temperature. I can't, cannot negotiate that. That will simply happen. That's a physical boundary condition, so to speak, that simply occur. They are unnegotiable. And that's, of course, something one has to realize. Ethics has to take into account the fundamental physical basis, so to speak, of the interaction of us with our environment. Environment, meaning the physical environment, so atmosphere, climate, and all these things, but also our co-living beings that we have in our world, biodiversity, so to speak, for example, we interact with that as well. The consequences we induce in that overall system, we cannot negotiate, they will simply happen. So ethics on the one hand side has to take these unchangeable boundary conditions into account and only in front of that picture, so to speak, negoti then negotiate uh, our, with our co-humans how to deal with those. And these, of course, real, um, is relevant for many in negotiations that occur, for example, between more developed and less developed countries, to give just one dominant uh, example. Yeah, who is uh, responsible for the development, who is uh, responsible for less children, for reduction of population growth, for example. How do we do that? How do we interrelate with that? And that, of course, is discursive things, but we always have to take that into account. If there are too many people in the globe, then the resource consumption will be larger and that is of course detrimental for our situ situation on a whole. So th these boundary conditions, the consequences, so to speak, they cannot be negotiated. At that point I should say all that has been worked out in much more detail in this book that I have written, published beginning of 2018. As I already, already said in the introductory video, um, it's not an easy read. You really have to want to understand philosophy because that's large to large part what my, my view of that, so to speak, that I talk about here. Those things I only briefly touch, in very the essential things I only explain in the videos and the last two uh, chapters are then about uh, the, our successful future, how that is really related always, our responsibilities and all these things. Also, 
all included in here, more or less. But as I said, it's not an easy read. If you love to read such, such things, you're of course cordially invited to, to buy that book and to read it. But I do not directly recommend it, so to speak, because it's really not an easy read. Okay, so as a consequence of this video, we realize we are responsible and it's our choices to be made. And keeping that in mind, we can now look, look back to the more technical results, so to speak. And I will only very briefly mention them. I don't go through the details again. Please have a look at the conclusions video. There they are discussed in all detail and they also refer back to the previous videos, so the very first videos in this series, where these diagrams are discussed in all detail. So if we see that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is continually rising, and we see it's us who is emitting the CO2, then we are simply responsible and we have to do something about getting that curve down, so to speak, to get the curve to uh, manage the CO2 in the atmosphere with this entire system. And this is just, this, the te temperature increase is associated with the CO2 concentration. That's just physical boundary condition. We can't negotiate that. On the other hand side, we have to see in this triangle, and that's why I'm showing it here, that we again individually are responsible, we are the drivers, we elect the politicians, we have our demands that are, then are supplied by industry or by agriculture or whatever. So it's our demands that we have, so we are the driver behind that, we with our individual responsibility for our choices. Yeah, so we cannot delegate that to somebody else, we can't delegate it to the politicians. We can't say, well, the politicians make the world better, that doesn't work. We can't say to the industries, well, do make the world better. That doesn't work. It's us. It's us who is the driver. So we have to change our behavior, our choices, our preferences. Only then it will work. That's very, very, very fundamental. We have to regard the systems view because we see that interplay, which is worked out in more detail in the, in the, in the videos before. We have to see that actually, if we want to get the entire system to better behavior, we can't leave it to the free interplay of the individuals that are taking part in this game, so to speak. We have to take the system's view, have to realize that as individuals we are the driver and that we, have, we are the only entity that really has a freedom of choice. It's us who has that freedom of choice. A nation doesn't have a free will. A company, industrial company, doesn't have the free will. It's always the individual that has a free will. That has been worked out in this video, I guess, quite clearly. So if you want to take the system's view and if you want to act such that we reach sustainable development, the, the individual, us, has to be aware of, the, of his or her influence on the system. And that's why I actually recorded the videos to show a little bit what the major drivers us to show, to become aware myself. That was the original uh, intention, but I now told also you so that you know the interplays between the different parameters and can act accordingly because also you have to realize also you are responsible. Finally, you are the, it's responsible for your individual choices, for the options you choose, for your sustainability in your life, your number of children, your food preferences. It's your choice. What matters uh, is shown here. I don't go through the details again. This is worked out in all detail. The main point is again, it's the individual choices that determine our future, the number of children and the plant-based versus the animal-based food, where we should go more for plant-based food and of course reduce the consumption of resources. But it's also the interaction of our individuals, so how we elect our politicians, for example, the demands that we have with respect to industry, that's all interaction between individuals. And then there are some general aspects, namely, for example, that the solution cannot be top down, it cannot be defined by the politicians because we are the drivers. They can't drive us, we are driving ourselves, so to speak. They can't do anything about what we are doing. We decide what we are doing, and the politicians, well, they can make the laws, but I mean, if we don't like the laws, the politician wouldn't be there then when the next election occurs and after that the law would be changed. Yeah? So apparently it's us who are in the driver's seat. Okay, I don't go through these things in more detail. The only thing I want to go through in this, this very last slide, so to speak, about the conclusions overall from this more technical part because that, to keep that in mind, one, I think one can't remind us of those things often enough. I have shown that it's possible to reach the climate goals with available technology, but it has to be systematically applied on a larger scale. We significantly need, need to increase the global effort 
and a growth rate of sustainable energy technologies by 20 to 30 percent per year are essentially required. And that's also relating directly to our choices. Yeah? What we do, which politicians we elect, which things we buy, which demands we have. That is directly related to that. And if we want to really reach the climate goals, we have to grow until we reach these limits and then maintain these limits for extended periods of time. Namely, replace the fossil resources annually by up to 3% per year until 2050, if you want to reach the 1.5 degree centigrade goal, or replace fossil resources by 2% per year until the year 2075, if you want to reach the 2 degree centigrade goal. And latest knowledge is, so to speak, that we should actually be going for this 1.5 degree centigrade goal. And I work out, actually, that I believe that that is beyond our reach, if we do not instantaneously and really massively change our choices and our behavior and go for that. If we don't do that, we won't be able to reach that goal. On the other hand side, I've shown that food supply is critical, but the change of individual choices is essential to manage that. That's the number of children and the plant-based, preferentially plant-based versus the animal-based food. I also have shown that bio-based or CO2-based materials can be produced, those the plastics, for example, that we used. That's feasible, but it can't be only from the third generation biomass if we do the, take the bio route, so to speak, because the rice straw, corn straw and all these side products from food production, they are not sufficient to supply all the things that we need and that we use today. Even if we account for some savings, for some recycling or so, it will not be enough. We have to directly go, unfortunately, into the competition for the land area by biomass for materials use and food production. Bioenergy, on the other hand side, should be minimized because it's always in the competition as well with the, um, uh, with the food production. And energy we can actually produce from solar power or from, from wind energy. So we have alternatives that do not compete for the land area. We should use those and not bioenergy. In bioenergy, there are some cases where we need it, jet fuel, for example, but we should try to minimize it as much as possible because we are always running into this competition for land area between fuel and food. Systems U is required instead of focus on own interests. I mentioned that already. And it can actually be that we will be passing a developmental tipping point, especially then if population continues to grow, the world will not be able to possibly supply su su sufficient food so that these countries with the, which, which have the strong population growth at the moment, that they will be able to develop, which means actually their situation gets bad. And that typically leads to more children. You know, the fertility typically increases, the number of children per woman increases. And that is, of course, detrimental. That gives a runaway situation which we cannot handle anymore. So that can, can occur. And that's actually why we should put all effort into developing less developed countries as much as possible, as quickly as possible, because that is only beneficial for the entire system. And also use uh, renewable energies as much as possible, because that limits the climate, which again decreases the pressure on the less developed countries. And we are individual, individually responsible. I've shown that in this diagram. It's just, not just a question of politics and technology. It's us who decide. And technology, actually, if we have take a wrong decisions, then technology and politics won't be able to solve the problem anymore. It's us who, so to speak, pave the way and then we can really use technologies or not. You know, if we keep up growing in population, if we keep up increasing our animal-based food fraction, then actually all technology that, or even all technological development will not be sufficient to feed everybody sufficiently. Currently, the world, the number of undernourished people globally is increasing. Yeah? Even though decreasing hunger is one of our major goals. No, we don't manage. Yeah? We are running out of, uh, the system is running out of control if we don't, and we need to take control again. And it has to happen now, otherwise the situation will get bad during our lifetime. Our lifetime, not only mine, yours as well. If you are a little bit younger as me, then definitely it will be in your lifetime. And of our children. Now, the final conclusion, so to speak, from, from this video. We have free will. We cannot predict what's happening. It is us who preset the preferences as probabilities, which means we are fundamentally responsible because also we are the uh, primary cause for the choices we take. We are individually responsible 
also for keeping our little planet Earth a life-supporting system, and that is really at stakes at the moment. And we are also individually responsible for ensuring well-being for everybody. And I would like to show this video again, this uh, scene, our system on which we are living, so to speak, seen from the moon. We see the Earth rise and we have to realize that's really all that we got. We can't go, if you need some resource, if you are running out of a resource, we can't just go to a neighbor and ask him if he can, can help us out. There is no neighbor yeah, whom we can ask. So we have to somehow manage on this system, Earth, the environment, the other living beings on this planet, which are essential also for our life, with the bees, for example, that is heavily discussed, but also with our co-humans, yeah? migration, for example, those issues, they depend on us taking the right choices for an overall global development in the direction of sustainability and well-being. And we should be caring for that. Everybody of us should be caring. It's not over-exaggerated or some uh, esoteric view or so, it's just our essential needs. If you want to survive, also in the more developed countries, in a sufficient well-being into the future, we need to take the action as well. Okay, so that's all we got. I hope that I induced some understanding for the major parameters interrelating in this overall game. I hope, well, it's not really a game, it's our lives in the end. Uh, so I hope I could transfer some insight into these things. I'm sure that not all of you will totally agree, and of course you are free to disagree, but at least I have given you some additional well, graphics that show the direct interrelation, and this are, as I said, publicly available data, and they cannot really be negotiated. The only thing that you can negotiate is more or less the consequences from that, and there you can come up, of course, with other options that you may think about. Okay, with that I would like to say thank you. I hope that it induced some thinking and some insight in you in this very general topic that is so decisive for our survival. And, well, I thank you for watching this video. And if you haven't seen all the other videos, I, you are, of course, cordially invited to watch them.